Hello, everybody. I am Anna Vondracek, Head of Artistic Department at Bozar, and I would like to wish you a very warm welcome to this virtual book lounge. Everything passes except the past. Um, this project is the result of a long-lasting collaboration between the Center for Fine Arts Brussels Bozar and the Goethe Institute Brussels. We are extremely happy to be able to co-present this publication with the Goethe Institute, which is for us at Bozar a very valuable partner when it comes to going out of our comfort zone and addressing most timely and necessary issues, such as the tricky questions of colonial legacies in the fields of culture and museum practices. These kinds of projects that remind us at Bozar, a large scale European culture institutions of our responsibility in creating physical, but also mental spaces for debate and exchange and being an actor for societal change. We will continue to address the issue of decolonizing the culture sector in the coming months through several other debates, and we hope to see you all there too. Thank you for being here with us tonight, and thank you to the Goethe Institute, and especially for Jana Heckel for making this possible, and thank you for, to Ayoko Mensa and Bozar colleagues for having made the links. I'll now pass the floor to Ayoko Mensa, who will introduce the speakers to you, and I wish you a very good evening, of course. Thank you, Anna. Good, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be the moderator of this webinar organized by Bozar and the Goethe Institute Brussels to celebrate the release of this awaited book, Everything Passes Except the Past, which gives a deep insight on an ambitious and transversal post-colonial project that took place in 2019 and 2020 in four different countries, Belgium, France, Portugal, and Spain, and ended by an exhibition in Italy in September 2020. Everything Passes Except the Past was a large-scale project of the Goethe Institute Brussels in cooperation with other institutes, a Goethe Institute and several partners. At the center of it was the artistic discursive engagement with the past that remains present in the museum, in the public spaces, and in the picture archives of these countries. To present this amazing project and the reflection it arose, it's a pleasure to have with us the curator of the project and the book director, Dr. Jana Eckel, and five great participants and contributors of the book. Good evening, dear, dear guests. Before introducing them, let me present you briefly the program of the webinar. First of all, Jana will share with us an overview of the book and its complex story. Then we will listen to the presentation of our panelists. And if we are on time, what I hope, we will continue with a conversation between them. And at eight o'clock, we will start a QA and a for 30 minutes. So of course, you can write your question in the chat as soon as the presentation starts. Olga, my colleague who is in charge of the technical side, will gather the question and I will, I will ask them to the panelists. So now let me, let, uh, let me introduce, let you introduce you the, um, uh, the panelists. Uh, first of all, Jana, Dr. Jana Ekel. Um, you are the curators of the Everything's Past Except the Past project and the book director. You are an art historian, independent curator and lecturer based in Brussels. You hold a PhD in art history and you are an associate researcher at the KU Leuven. Your written and curatorial work focuses on the critical reflection of visual representation and documentation strategies in photography with a special interest in, in postcolonial theory and intersectional feminism. Your recent curated group exhibitions include Resistant Faces in Munich, Everything Passes Except the Past so in Torino, and Performing the Border in Vienna. Thank you, Jana for being here. Um, let me introduce uh, Dr. Clementine Delis. Good evening, Clementine. Thank you also really for being with us. It's a really an honor and a pleasure. So you work across the borders of contemporary art, curatorial practice and critical theory. You are associate curator at the KW Institute for Contemporary Art. And between 2010 and 2015, you directed the Weltkulturen Museum in Frankfurt instituting a new research lab for remediating collections held in ethnographic museums. You are developing Generator, 
a new art project together with African Artist Foundation in Lagos. And you recently published a book on your concept of metabolic museum. Um, yeah. Then we will um, listen to, to Ya. Uh, good evening, Ya. Ya Ade Nantui. Uh, you are a Ghanaian British curator, writer, and teaching artist. Rooted in the in, in indigenous African invention, you work to reimagine cultural infrastructure and expand means of producing art histories. Drawn to collective knowledge making, you co-created the 10-week course Black Diaspora Literacy from Negritude to Drac. Currently based in London, you are a culture staff writer at Amaka Magazine, and you manage a digital studio, Accra, which offers an online anti-colonial art history and cubata, decolonize the art world, and a residency program, the Imaginarium. Thank you for, for being here. Yeah. Uh, Duan. Jetro, you are a junior research fellow at the Center for Curating the Archive at the University of Cape Town. And we know what you are really uh, going through now. So really many thanks for, for being here because it's really a very hard time uh, for you. Um, so you work on contested public cultures and the cultural construction of heritage. You also have held a postdoctoral position in the research project Making Differences, Transforming Museum and Heritage in the 21st Century at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Grace Ndretu, thank you, um, Grace, uh, for being with us uh, this evening for this, this webinar and the launch of, of, uh, of the book. Um, you are a British Kenyan artist based now in Brussels also, so we are a lot uh, in in, in Brussels uh, this evening. Um, your artworks are concerned with the transformation of our contemporary world, including the impact of globalization and environmental justice through your films, photography, paintings, and social practice project with refugees, migrants, and indigenous groups. Your work is housed in museums collections, such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Modern Art Museum in Warsaw. And your exper experimental art writing and images have been published by the Whitechapel Gallery, the Paris Review, the MIT Press, and the Oxford University Press, among others. Um, and last but uh, not least, <laughs> I would say Bianca Baldi, many thanks for uh, being with us this evening. Um, you are a South African artist based in Brussels too. You deal with hidden infrastructures and narratives in your films, installations, photographs, and images, evoking the histories of film, studio photography, and trompe l'oeil. You position carefully chosen objects and images, revealing complex webs of political, economic, and cultural influences. Your work has been featured in several international exhibitions, such as Les Rencontres de Bamako in Mali or the Shanghai Biennale in, in China. Thank you very much. So I think now let's start really, you know, uh, to go into uh, this amazing project and, uh, and book. So the floor, the floor is yours, Ayana. Uh, you unmute, please. Yeah. Am I unmuted? No, you can hear me. Yes. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Ayoko. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Olga. You are uh, today supporting us from the background. Um, thank you for the invitation and doing this also, Ayoko, within the framework of the Afropolitan Desk and Festival that you are um, yeah, leading since several years. And um, before diving uh, deeper into the book, I uh, would like to send my special thanks again to the speakers, to the authors who are not with us today, but who also contributed to the book. And of course, also to all participants um, of the project. Um, as you already said, the project uh, took place between um, 2019 and 2020 and was organized in collaboration with various Goethe Institutes and partners in uh, Belgium, France, Portugal, Italy and Spain. And I also would like to thank at this uh, moment all my colleagues uh, who made it possible and warm hello to all the different countries. 
Um, yeah, the project grew out of the need and the observation, you can say that the former European countries um, and powers are facing difficulties when it comes to uh, dealing with their or accepting the responsibilities of uh, their past and the consequences. In Germany, uh, for example, the public debate on colonial heritage just uh, started a few years ago and has been for very long ignored when it comes to school education. Um, when we began with our research, the discussion, and this is uh, important to know, was really at a different place. Um, experts and activists who were calling for the decolonization of museum archives of urban areas and more generally spoken of mindsets, um, did so from mainly marginalized positions. Um, this has changed, but only recently um, the Black Lives Matters movements revealed a growing public awareness and engagement against uh, racist violence and historical injustice. Uh, in the wake of the demonstration that we all followed um, around uh, yeah, uh, various different continents and countries, several colonial statues and monuments uh, were defaced and some were ultimately taken down. And uh, the colonial legacies of monument, ethnographic collections and image archives are now uh, or became suddenly uh, into the, came to the spotlight of political and social debates. On the other hand, what we see is that the heat is discussions around the opening of the Humboldt Forum in Berlin or uh, here in, in Brussels in Belgium, the Tavira Museum revealed that ethnographic museums have to face demands for a critical reappraisal of their collections. Um, and the publication of the restitution report by Felwyn Sa and Benedict Savoy in November 2018 has uh, put a new pressure on ethnographic museums. So what our projects try to do is um, yeah, taking an artistic and uh, discursive approach to come to grips with the part that remains present uh, in museums, in public space and uh, image archives of the colonizing countries. And um, yeah, we organized in 2019 various workshops uh, with participants from African, Latin American and European countries and discussed this very um, difficult and uh, sensitive topics and um, then also uh, later, as you mentioned in the introduction, Ayoko um, made uh, organized a festival and an exhibition in Italy at the Fondazione Sandretto Rebaudengo. So all these uh, leads to the book project that is really um, a project uh, that has so many people involved. Um, and uh, the main questions that are addressed in the book are, on the one hand, how can the transformation of a colonial institution into a space for post-colonial discourse uh, succeed? Uh, how can institutions extend the process of decolonization and put it in good use? And also this, um, which is very important for our debate here today, what can artists, researchers and activists from the Global South contribute to this difficult process? And now I would like to go into the presentation of uh, the book. Olga, maybe again, you can go to the, exactly to the, um, thank you, um, table of contents. So you can see that the book is um, yeah, organized into three different sections that are related to the workshops that we organized. Um, each uh, chapter is dealing on, um, yeah, with the uh, first chapter is on ethnographic museums and the debate of restitution, the second on the opening of colonial film archives, and the third one on dealing with colonial legacies in public space. Um, important for the book was to close um, each chap uh, chapter with a code of action and reflection. And this code was developed together with the um, participants of the workshops um, that are of course also all named. And we hope that um, these uh, codes can like really be put, yeah, put to good use by institution and can um, help um, yeah, and decision makers uh, in, in this um, difficult process. You will find um, also in the book a broad range of text forms. You will find conversations, academic essays, um, image-based artworks, and uh, fiction text. And um, all these, of course, also implement different uh, writing techniques. And um, 
uh, you see that uh, yeah the the text also reflects the horizontal um, structure of our workshop um, um, phase and uh, try to really give voice to different um, activist artistic uh, curatorial approaches um, yeah this is from my side so far um, yeah and I think we will have also the chance to to later go a little bit more, more yeah, deeper into the book uh, when the presentations of the speakers um, are following. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jana. Yes, it's just a kind of um, yeah, teaser, you know, of uh, yeah. yes, the the, the, the richness the <laughs> of the yes of the uh, of the book. Um, so um, maybe I, I will. Uh, Yes, introduce uh, Clementine, um, mm -hmm. please, if you, uh, sure. uh, the floor is yours for, for yeah, your presentation and your, uh, uh, on your also incredible article on the Metabolic Museum that you Thank wrote for you. the book. Thank you. I'd like to first begin by thanking Bozar for hosting this event. It, it's, I'm excited about it. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Jana Hekel for keeping, you know, keeping hold of the project and running with it and publishing the book. I think Goethe Institute is doing a lot of good work at the moment all over the world, trying to understand how museums are transitioning, how they're changing. And so I'm, I'm delighted to be here, thank you. I guess um, if you read the title of the essay that I uh, wrote for this book, you'll see that it's called Walking Through the Metabolic Practice of the Museum. And I think maybe I should begin by with, with questions of terminology. I, I've always used the word organ. I'm interested in the idea of the organ as something that is produced as a kind of a relationship between curators and artists in particular, and that has to have a, a vital reason. It can't just be a cosmetic addition to what we already have. Mm -hmm. So when I speak of um, metabolic and I speak of remediation and I speak of organs, I'm really talking about agency and interdependency. Uh, in the case of the museum, I'm talking about movement between collections, between human beings, uh, very important. The ergonomy within a, a museum, this walking through, this swiping through exhibitions. And of course, between concepts of workspace. In other words, an engagement deals with the architectonic structures of museums and brings collections back from, if you like, the debasement of the store or the, the area of exclusion back in and makes them into the central node of all activities. And this process of remediation is necessary. It's a synesthetic phenomenology of media. It's transdisciplinary. And it includes immediately the body of the visitor. The body of the visitor, the corpus of the collection, the need for healing. And so the museum, in a way, in its kind of transmutational moment, which is, I hope, something that will be accelerated, one of maybe the only good points of the current period in which we're living. But the museum then becomes a kind of a lazarette for colonial trauma, present past in Sadia Hartman's words, um, a location for recharging collections, for rehabilitating the body within the context of, of cultural heritage, uh, providing access, engagement, but also remediation can also take small operations, right? Modest, very non-exclusive developments. It isn't about creating a new curriculum. And organs in the context of what we're talking about today is a particularly poignant word. If you think of organs as not just the trafficking of organs today under the radar, which is something quite important and can be related to the trafficking of tribal art or the trafficking of people. Organs in the context of an ethnographic collection are both human remains, but they are also the artifacts um, that have a, that are kind of severed from some interpretational dynamic and original alliances. So organs, when they become archival, they contain legal issues. So I'm interested in looking at any collection fundamentally. The ethnographic is the most ob obscene collection produced by, through power and through exploitation that exists in Europe and probably in the world. So I'm interested in these collections containing live wires, stored code, uh, both objects of virtue and also materialized trauma. And for that, I think that when you look at restitution today in 2021, and I compare it to when I left the museum in Frankfurt in 2015, 
Well, there's a lot more discussion. I mean, there's really uh, established positions. You have historicism, provenance studies in Germany. You have forensic imaging in uh, Paris, in France. You have a kind of general relic diplomacy. You have the British being terribly quiet because it's all to do with race and class. It's all too slow. There are too few interlocutors from the African continent. More and more, you realize that it's a kind of a balancing act, act between polite academics and annoyed, quite rightly annoyed activists. Mm. Uh, but they're, they're, for me, what's really important here is this question of what do we do while restitution takes its course? What do we do with the collections here? Why isn't there more of a lobby that insists on rights of access? And that's where I come to this question of the civic institutions that we deal with, art academies, museums, universities. And in my experience, one of the easiest ways to create a serious institutional critique that hits at the nerve is to transvest positions, transvest discourse, modus operandi, and perform ultimately a kind of academic iconoclasm. And I cannot see my position within the current debate on performing the decolonial outside of a form of academic iconoclasm. If I have any role to play as a white European academic, artist, curator, whatever you want to call me, than it is in trying to decimate these barriers that put art history on one side, anthropology on another side, that in continue to use notions of regionalism or even much worse, ethnicity. So what I've been doing for the last three years with students and now at KW is number one, a kind of a, a reprioritization of the space of the museum. That means we do not go into amphitheaters. What is this idea of having academic discursive discussions while all the art is being quietly left alone? No, to occupy the space of museums and exhibitions, which is what we did with the MMU or the Muse Metabolic Museum University in Ljubljana, where we actually squatted the space. We held seminars inside natural history museums everywhere. There were tables uh, which were attached or chairs which had uh, tables attached to them and mini beamers so that we could spam the hang. In other words, exploit the very fact that hang, the hang in an exhibition has become so normative that if you provide mini beamers, chairs, computer connections, young people, all people of all ages can come into the museum and begin to work, begin to think, begin to add their own, um, their own referentiality. And the final um, case of the MMU, which is what we're working on now at KW in Berlin, is a kind of a, a constant shift between a metabolic museum university, so these two portentous terms, these concepts with their bulk, but then also the Bureau d'Esprit, so the Office of the Mind, the debating chamber, the faculty, the prototype collection. So we're tackling these ominous and important words from the past. And it's a group of people that I put together for artists from Egypt, Germany, Fiji, First Nations, Canada, situation designers, an art historian, a composer, a novelist, a publisher, a curator, and a lawyer. And we have begun pre-corona to investigate the crypts in Berlin, neighborhood museums, university research collections, museum collections, private collector's material and artist collections in many, way to, uh, many ways to understand what is contentious, what can't be shown, right? What is causing problems in representation at the moment? And uh, believe me, that can be many things. It's not only related to colonialism in the most obvious way. There are entire bodies of work that were purchased in the 80s that today wouldn't be shown. So uh, this working around contention, around collections, around the, re the rethinking of spaces has led us also in the corona period to try and work out, to try and do it in a reverse sense, to say, okay, well, what is our research collection? What are we working with individually? And all sorts of things come out, you know, uh, recordings that can't be used, objects that are that are highly problematic, that are part of one's research as an artist, and then can't be brought into a public sphere. So all of this, in a way, is to understand what a new ecology might be in terms of collections and collecting, what infrastructure is necessary, and how we can uh, effectively together build a new methodology. And I reckon, and this is my final point, that this notion of a museum university 
for which we do need many models. And it's not just my own proposition. It could be many different ways of looking at this. Um, it may be ultimately in the times in which we are, one of the only arguments we have left for not closing down a museum. In other words, uh, not allowing politics, politicians to say, well, this kind of museum entertainment, we don't need it anymore. But actually pushing against that grain and saying, if we create new civic centers for trans for transdisciplinary research, teaching and production based on the collections that are already here, then we might get somewhere and we might respond to the, diaspor the diasporic student body that is literally waiting to work with these collections. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Clementine um, Delis. Um, I'm sure, yeah. We will have the opportunity to uh, talk more, maybe about you know your your experience in in Ljubljana and maybe the next one you are uh, working on on, on this uh, really new new ways uh, of uh, curatorial uh, museum practices. Um, and and also I think what is really interesting that uh, you conceive and you implement um, projects now between Europe and Africa, mm -hmm. and uh, where and the contexts are completely different. But uh, mm -hmm. I think also one really of the great interest of the project uh, of the Everything Spaces except the Past project uh, was to really gather professionals from Europe and Africa and uh, to. Um, let them also share, you know, their um, their views, their experience, and and they're completely also different uh, uh, contexts. Mm -hmm. um, so th that was really fascinating. I have to say that for me, it was really one of the most, uh, I mean, uh, added value of the of the project. You know, uh, this bridge. Uh, you know, yes, built between you know, know the professionals. You, yeah. you, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. talk about her museum.net mm -hmm. because it's something um, that is it's 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 another project to do with rapid response yeah. restitution. Okay. And yeah. we can talk about it later, but I don't really talk about it in the article. So I yeah, only no, say so I, I didn't no, want to bring in too much. No, it's know, true. I wanted yeah. to say, okay, from the it's, position of Europe, this is what could be yeah. done. Yeah. Right. Um, right. And of course, we need more voices from the continent, all sorts of voices, not just the voices sitting in universities. I mean, this is really important, but also questions of retrievals of authorship. Um, the, the, I went to, in the very short time that I was in Lagos last year, we visited outside of Lagos, 10 museums and their storage facilities. And it was at the end of that, that it became clear that we needed to begin a conversation and that we could do that through home museum. But this is just, you know, a beginning. It's only a beginning. And, and I think that I'm, I'm very glad that this book is coming out. Um, I hope it'll be easily available online and uh, that, you know, one can do more with the book, that yeah. it leads to more smaller nucleus uh, of debates. Because the more debates that go on around these museums, the better. And I mean, that's, that's really at the end of the day where I, where I will battle till I die. And that is that there is no way that they can prevent right of access to collections today in Europe. It's just not possible. You can't tell me that returning 26 objects to Benin City has resolved the problem and that now we can all go home and watch more of these ghastly displays, xenophobic displays. No, there has to be a new type of architecture that's built. And the only way that I can imagine it is if it doesn't have the colonial matrix of a museum, if it's much more like an expanse, right? That where uh, it's it's I don't know I mean it's it's like a a hot house in the it's it sort of has a kind of anti conservational aspect to it right the material has to come out one has to look at it and work with it and because the Europeans were so kleptomaniacal they collected so many doubles so there's a, a real hoarding going on and you just don't know why right uh, and a lot of it has to do with ideologies of conservation. And that yeah. is an ideology. There's nothing, you know, no blood, no sweat, no, no breath, no touch, no human relationship to the object, then wow, it'll last a thousand years. Where, right? And the digital is necessary, but it doesn't replace the engagement with things, right? That's what we experience now as humans. 
We want to see people. <laughs> you know, and cultural heritage can't be reduced to the rights of other museums over images, which is what it is, over the fabrication through forensic imaging of entire, you know, replicas from inside outwards. So it's it's a it's a moment to to for a call of action, a call to action. Thank you, Clementine. I'm sure, yeah, that uh, yes, you've got also you share, you know, this really critical approach on uh, access to to collections, of course, and uh, different ways. So um, you you wrote uh, also a really uh, great article on the kiosk uh, model and the project. Um, you're involved in, in Ghana, especially. Uh, please, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I, again, I also want to start with thanking everyone. I want to start with Dr. Yana and Ayoko for hosting and all the panelists, especially going after Clementine, who's really, really like, that's a great segue into the Kiosk Museum and the reflections on it. I, I, Something I particularly enjoy about both the conference, everything past the sector, past 2019, and now this um, following book is just the opportunity to reflect. So I wrote this essay now, this was last year, 2020. And since then I have spent a lot of time learning about the kiosk, reflecting about the kiosk museum. So in my presentation will be both some of what I go into the essay and things that I have been able to realize with time. Um, but first, to start off with what the Kiosk Museum is. So in 2015, this is the first prototype of the Kiosk Museum called Agbaku, which means untold in Ga, um, which is one of the ethnic groups in Ghana, specifically where this kiosk was displayed in Accra, is the indigenous lands of the Ga people. And this was at the Chalewate Festival, which is or has been up until this point because the pandemic has thrown a lot of things off the largest street art festival in West Africa. And this was a 2015 edition, which was themed African electronics. It was about different culture technologies, ways that we can use indigenous knowledge to create new futures. And the Kiosk Museum, which was designed by Dr. Osio Asare, Latifa Idris and um, Nana Foreta Eim, who's the head curator of Anno Institute of Arts and Knowledge, was displayed here. So here we have um, photographs by the Ga photographer Nia Obadai of Jamestown, which is the area in which the kiosk was shown. And as you can see, there's like little inscriptions and how it functioned was really like, if, if you are familiar with West African architecture, the kiosk is like a, ever present um, structure, which is used for shops as homes, um, really anything you can think of, it's they're everywhere, but they're also seen as visual pollution, especially in this time of rapid development, um, being replaced with skyscrapers, often being demolished, um, not really having land, the same rights to land, even though it's um, one of our most affordable forms of architecture. And specifically Latifa Idris, the, the main architect on this project, a lot of her work is around using sustainable materials and sustainable styles to make um, housing specifically more um, accessible. And so this project was about how the kiosk could be used to invite people into the gallery space. So in my essay, I talk about the context of the Ghanaian National Museum, our first um, museum, which is now defunct, unfortunately, but was initially launched the day before Ghana's independence. Um, so that was March 5th, 1957. But due to lack of maintenance um, and politics and whatnot has, um, has unfortunately been closed for the past five years and is debilitating. But even our sort of National Museum, which was literally launched before Independence Day, was um, also about 40% of the permanent collection comes from that of a British archaeologist, Charles Shaw, which already kind of sets a tone for what the values of this museum is. And so my essay, which is titled Creating Culturally Contextual Models Exhibition in Ghana, is more so about assessing the context of museums. And if we are to have a similar, um, a similar, it was a whole space for cultural knowledge in Accra, how can we do it in a way that is contextual, that is um, mindful, that is also dynamic. And very much this experiment of the Kiosk Museum was based on research through speaking with people. We had a, a tour of um, all the regions in Ghana, speaking with knowledge keepers, um, 
really, and also just anyone, we'll just strike conversation on the street. We had like interpreters working with us to basically do primary research on how people understand culture and from there be able to design um, an exhibition structure that would make sense. So, um, sorry, the, the images are going by, but if you go to like the next maybe three images or two images, um, so the next one, the next one. Yes, so this was the, the latest um, after the 2015 prototype and the um, two years of research, this was the latest um, version of the Kiosk Museum, which was in Accra now outside of the Osumanche, which is um, the one of the chief's palace. And we, this was now like, this is like an updated version with um, cultural programming. And because um, I have limited time just to like, fast forward to what I would approach differently or what I, I have reflected on now is that as much as um, I realize that um, a museum space is more than just like the architecture itself and maybe that's where we could have done more it was less so only changing the structure but also the values of it and while that was challenged by you know using the kilts by the ephemeral nature of it not um, falling into the colonial matrix of accumulation and extraction it still did um like i i do wish that for example with the um exhibition writing that had been co-written so while we are uh, uh our intentions was one of shifting towards communal ways of exhibition and cultural storytelling. I see that in practice, there's all these different ways in which, um, yeah, I think um, moving slowly, moving slower, but that takes time. Shifting like um, ingrained cultural technology or shifting like curatorial traditions takes time. And even with the two years, even with the many prototypes, I you know, a year later, I'm like, wait, <laughs> ding, 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 this could have been done differently. And um, so I think even as a curator, just learning to have compassion and patience, I'm in curiosity um, and valuing those as, valuing those and letting that guide the way in which we reshift how we relate to museums. So I'm gonna end there because it's time, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's really a fascinating project. I think you you have much more to 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 say about you know all this uh, also transversal aspects of of, uh, of the project. Um, just um, one one quick question, but it could be interesting just to 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 say how this project is it is it um, related also to your decolonial project on art history, or is it? Are they are they separated or really do you do you link these two approaches? So I would say that the so the the two separate projects decolonize the art world being a, a research platform where I and other curators and writers use the internet um, and what I would say is like memes, yeah, are ways of like transmitting our historical essays into. Um, into formats that are more widely distributed through the internet. And also I'm, I'm like 24, so, you know, it's a demographic using memes and like um, Instagram to really get more people into like our history, our historical conversations. Um, because I just sort of entered it really by in, in school, but it's something that it, it's, it's funny that while this affects so many people, it's the conversations are still so insular. And so I'm, I look to decolonize our world is, was my way of experimenting with other tools like Instagram um, and Tumblr to bring more people into conversations around um, what we, how museums can be more relevant to us. But the ways in which I'll say it's related is that this definitely inspired my curiosity um, and my willingness to try and fail. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um... Dr. Joan uh, Jetro, um, yes, thank you for uh, being with us. Yes, from uh, Cape Town, uh, I'm sure that you you share uh, most of the questions. Uh, yeah, um, said by by Jan, um, but um, I just yeah uh, give you the floor. You know, um, yeah, please. 
Uh, firstly, many thanks to Boza for hosting this conversation and many thanks to the Kuth Institute also for sponsoring this um, fantastic project. It was really amazing to be a part of it. And many thanks to Jana also for persistence and energy and inspiration in uh, getting it uh, together and for seeing it through. Um, uh, my biography is published on the in the in the chat section. I, I think it, it was it wasn't mentioned that I was a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Anthropological Research on Museums and Heritage uh, with Professor Sharon McDonald. Um, I wonder if it is possible for me to share my screen. I have three images to show um, related to uh, the events uh, yes. most recently. Yes, yeah. So on Sunday, uh, the 18th of April, um, uh, a natural wildfire uh, was ignited on, set on Sunday afternoon here in, in the city of Cape Town on the peaks of, of uh, Devil's Peak, which is next to Table Mountain. Uh, through the course of uh, Sunday, uh, the fire continued to spread and it spread down the mountainside and eventually reached the uh, upper campus of the University of Cape Town. Throughout the day, uh, myself and other colleagues were uh, exchanging messages following the uh, spread of this, um, uh, of this uh, raging wildfire. And to, yeah, to our great concern, the fire spread to the upper campus and eventually in the late afternoon, um, we got news that some of the buildings uh, had been uh, set alight. Um, due to this wildfire. Um, and one of the buildings that, that was at the light was um, the African Studies building. I'll, I'll show you a video um, that was shared widely on, on WhatsApp with you to, to, to show you exactly the intensity of the inferno. Um, yeah, you can see the uh, African Studies library um, holding um, very precious collections of materials and firefighters trying to uh, extinguish, um, extinguish the blaze to, uh, uh, to little avail. Yesterday, the images started coming out um, of the extent of the damage um, that was done to the African Studies Library. Um, uh, the, the library itself has been gutted um, and um, some really important collections have been uh, destroyed. Uh, the building has been ruined, as you can see here. Um, the African film collection has been completely destroyed, um, and the librarians and the archivists are still um, picking through their records and, and what is available and what is uh, irreplaceably been lost. Um, this is the first floor of the library on the ground floor of the library and the basement of this building is the special collection section of our uh, university. These are the most precious collections of the University of Cape Town. Primary source material um, related to indigenous histories on um, in Southern Africa and on our continent. Um, truly irreplaceable records, books and manuscripts that go back centuries. Um, fortunately, it seems as if um, the architectural measures that were put in place for the preservation of these collections were effective, but we don't know about um, the destruction uh, due to water damage of the, the firefighters who came in and put out the blaze. On Sunday evening, it was reported by residents in another part of the city that um, ash was falling in the uh, suburbs. And this was a particularly poignant image for me, um, showing some of the uh, remnants and the traces and remains that um, uh, uh, we are sitting with um, at the moment. Um, our intellectual community in Cape Town is fractured. Um, we are sitting with a, with a kind of deep, deep archival grief. There's a, a profound sense of confusion um, and deep sense of loss about the, about the burning of the African Studies Library and the collections that were held there. Um, it's a very confusing time and it comes at a time when 
after after a long year of dealing with the COVID COVID pandemic and the economic crisis. And in a country such as ours with deep uh, inequality issues, it's it's really affected our students as well. Who um, just yesterday on a on a radio program, the a member of the Student Representative Council said that um, our students are really uh, traumatized. It's been a very, very difficult time for them. So um, in Cape Town, we're sitting with um, a, a really deep archival grief, um, a, an awkward sense of, of loss, of um, confusion about um, the extent of the loss, the loss of our library is also a huge epistemic blow. Um, we, we've lost our intellectual heritage in some way, and we have to find new ways of um, salvaging um, not only records, but also um, our ties and relations to our past, and we have to re-salvage them in, in new and different ways. Um, it's a very difficult thing to sit with, um, and it speaks to it speaks to the the topic for my essay for for this book um everything passes except the past it speaks to it speaks to it in in an adjacent way insofar as um the topic for our session of workshops in in barcelona was how to deal with colonial residues in public space and in that essay i tried to um in that essay i tried to think about um modes of social relations to addressing um, sometimes immovable forms of um, commemorative cultural forms. Um, but it's all well to think about how you're going to change things and how you're going to remove and how you're going to substitute things until the moment arrives when your archives are fundamentally incinerated um, they are incinerated, they are removed, and you have to sit with uh, with with a profound sense of loss and 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 remake your your uh, connections uh, to the past. Um, and the sense of misunderstanding that I have here about the relationship between these events in Cape Town and and the ones that reflect on in um, in Berlin, in Barcelona are precisely is precisely the space that um, I I try to occupy in the essay. A space of um, of of happenstance, but also a space of 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 misunderstandings, and sometimes that, that space of misunderstanding can be generative for um, for translating what what appear to be sometimes um, easy similarities, but that that conceal fundamental differences in what's going on in a particular context. In the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, Scholars, libra librarians, um, university officials will start um, pooling their resources to work out exactly what's what's been lost and um, and initiate the salvage um, process of trying to reconstitute our archives again. Um, the intellectual resources of um, our international community will also uh, be to our great benefit um, in all kinds of different ways. Um, we've received many messages of support from around the world um, and um, messages of condolences as well. And uh, so I'm just appealing to uh, the audience members to please keep the University of Cape Town in mind in the coming months um, as we embark on the difficult journey of um, repairing our archives reconstituting our heritage and finding a new way to establish relations to our past and the links that we have to other institutions in Europe and other parts of the world are going to be really important, not only substantively in terms of retrieving some of the records that, uh, that are sitting in duplicate in other places, but also the intellectual resources for thinking about ways for how do you go about um, reconstituting and salvaging an archive that has been lost in, in such a tragic fashion? So uh, thank you for the opportunity for letting me present. Thank you, uh, 
doing and I think really we we've heard you and we we measure uh, you know how you you feel and now the the, the challenges you know in the, in the coming days and weeks and months so really I think uh, yeah a lot of sorts of solidarity and I'm sure that everybody is really really touched by uh, by what 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 happens um I also really um would like to to um to say that yeah if the the, the public and everyone could um uh, also read your your essay you know in your article in the book because I think it it is really uh, very very relevant and interesting how you you have a look um at uh, all the political um issues especially you know uh on the uh, Cat, the Catalan uh, independence and the independentist, and also how it it um, it is um, also uh, you 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 make a kind of a, of analysis with also all the uh, unsaid racial issues you know that uh, that are masked with uh, you know all these uh, independence uh, questions. So I think really you 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 essay and your contribution to the to the project. Is, uh, is really very, very important. So um, thank you very much. Um, um, we're gonna uh, uh, now uh, listen to, to Grace um, uh, and, uh, and also your uh, very powerful uh, contribution on uh, healing the museum uh, and your, uh, your your project and also a performance. I uh, had the chance to um, to attend it uh, in Brussels at the Africa Museum, and it was uh, just an incredible moment uh, where everybody, uh, when everybody, uh, I mean, just uh, change uh, change uh, our own perspectives, you know, on the museum and and the collection. So please. Um, if you can share with us more about, you know, yeah, USA and this this concept of healing the museum. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. Thank you, Oka, and thank you, Jana, for inviting me to speak today. Um, yes, I mean, it's hard to follow Dwayne's presentation, obviously, but maybe what I'm going to say is somehow relevant. Um, so uh, I'd like to talk about, yes, my ongoing project, Healing the Museum, which started in 2013 uh, with the first performance in Musée de la Chasse and Nature in Paris and um, a twin performance at the Pompidou when I did my first uh, tra live transposition. So uh, it, my idea of healing the museum is to bring non-rational methodologies like meditation and shamanism into museums and for that to kind of affect how we interact with each other, with objects and the space. And so I saw immediately an effect of bringing these non-rational methodologies into museums, um, especially into problematic collections. Um, starting with the Musée Le Chasse and the Tour, uh, their collection of dead animals uh, in the first performance. And that was um, focusing on how can we free the souls of these dead animals who are kind of trapped in this building. And um, it was a very powerful performance as well, uh, because it was kind of in the, the basement of the museum. And so I got a lot of good feedback uh, from participants who saw um, different animal spirits on the shamanic journey uh, or dead pets and even dead relatives. And so this made me think really about how powerful this new way of working could be uh, in my practice. So after that, I traveled to the MoMA Warsaw and Antonio Tapes Foundation. And I also did a performance um, in, of the Healing Museum in the burnt out Macintosh building. So Macintosh Art School burnt down in 2015, accidentally, there was a fire and it burnt down, the building was 200 years old. And I remember the, um, I, I had access to the building, even though it was closed. Um, and I, would, I had access with the managers and the guys with the hard, hard hats. And they showed me um, the burnt out libraries and different things. And yeah, the feeling was a real pain, a feeling of um, trauma. So I can kind of relate to um, what Dwayne was talking about. 
And so my project focus began to focus more on ethnographic museums like the Tavera in, in Brussels. And, um, and then later also I went to the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver. Um, where I was invited by the Africa Studies um, Conference and to work with the First Nation Collection and the Africa Collection. And this was building on work uh, that the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver had already been doing um, with professors like James Clifford in the 90s and 2000s to open up the collection to source communities. And for me, that was very powerful to kind of be able to bring and exchange knowledge. So because of being part of the Goethe project for quite a long time beforehand and then going to Vancouver and being able to share this knowledge. And that was really important. And also, um, I also made a link with the museum um, in Argentina, because um, the Museum La Plata, which has a huge collection of um, human remains. And so I did research there about this kind of the conquest of the desert where they killed 10,000 Mapuches. And for me, again, that was really important to have face to face con um, connection with indigenous communities as well as diaspora communities. Because I think that's a key point of like how to move on and to think about um, to make a link about producing traditional indigenous knowledge and like how that has an effect on the museum. And so, um, for example, in Canada, you know, because of the work I've been doing, um, I was also invited um, to be in part of some First Nation um, um, rituals like sweat lodges and things um, because of my connection of wanting to really connect, the, make the link between environmental justice uh, indigenous communities and decolonizing museums. And this is a really important link uh, for me and one that I already began to feel in the Tavurin Museum. So the images that you're seeing are images from the performance that I did at the African Museum in Tavurin in Brussels. And so this was a really powerful experience for me also. You know, um, it started that morning uh, with my fun game of, um, there was like, there was the 20 participants uh, for the conference and I did a funny thing where I swapped all the name tags and I gave everyone the wrong name tags. So immediately everybody had a different gender, different races, they had different job titles and it really changed the power dynamics and, you know, began to have like a sense of humour between the different participants. And, and I thought that was kind of important because it's such a heavy conference to be dealing with and such heavy topics. And then um, I remember a feeling of that, how rare it is to do an opportunity to do something so intimate, like meditation um, in a museum with such a heavy colonial past. And that was also echoed by the fact that the director said that he'd never sat on the floor of his own museum in, in like, 18 years or whatever and that kind of shows you like how intimidating museums are and so we began uh, there he is <laughs> we began to um by a discussion in the gym and mineral gym gem and mineral galleries um by talking about the essay healing the museum and also doing a sitting meditation and then a walking meditation and this brought up a lot of mixed feelings um, from the different participants, especially the colleagues from the Congo who got very upset because of the sensitivity, you know, because obviously those objects are blood diamonds. They're taken, um, you know, not just unethically, traumatically from Africa to Belgium. Um, and so, you know, that energy is still in the object, even if they look very beautiful and on display. And so this moment of being able to meditate and to go through this kind of cathartic process uh, was very powerful. And it kind of led the group to bond later on when we were having to discuss more practical issues like legal frameworks, you know, for sending back objects, you know, maybe more like heavier, more uh, rational topics. And so, yeah, I just remember it being a very powerful experience. And I think, yeah, like I said, it's for me, it's a key moment in my long term work around this idea of 
stolen land, stolen culture, um, stolen climate. And that, that quote comes from an uh, activist group in London, BP or not to BP. And that really sums up, you know, the, um, I feel like there's still such a denial, especially in England, you know, um, with the museums like the British Museum and other museums about that connection between land, uh, culture and climate and um, how this is going to really affect uh, the upcoming um, years um, and, and, yeah, and, and centuries, honestly, uh, of how we look at collections, how we use objects, how we value objects and, you know, and how, you know, we value each other. So I guess that's, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Grace. And uh, it's true, it was a performative and artistic approach that really, I think, uh, yes, uh, shift the, the, the perspectives, but as an artist, because it's true they were in the, in the project, there were, um, I think, more researchers and academic and professional than uh, artists. Uh, Bianca, you, and also, you know, some uh, other artists um, um, were the, the participants. How did you, um, I mean, you know, find your, your, your place and uh, with, um, with the other participants? How did you engage with, with them? Well, I, I really like that challenge, you know, um, for me, my other works, another um, episode of Healing the Museum uh, was when I worked with refugees and migrants and people who worked at the UN and NATO and the Parliament. And so imagine these two very different groups of people who never meet <laughs> unless there's something bad, having to meet to do kind of like work on this art project and work on a shamanic um, performance together. For me, that's really key to kind of be a bridge, you know, and I guess it comes quite naturally. So I think it's kind of a fun challenge to be in a group of scientists and academics and museum directors and activists, you know, and um, yeah, being able to share information and learn. And, you know, since the conference that we did at the Tavern Museum, I've been to quite a lot of academic conferences about this subject. And it's true, there are no artists there. And there's very few activists. It's really very academic, very, you know, ivory tower. And it, and it's funny because I see the same people. They're not my colleagues, but I see the same people circulating. So now I get to know kind of, you know, I'm, I guess I'm like a spy, you know, just seeing what's going on, learning and whatever. So I'm, I'm an anthropologist in my own way, you know, going to these museums and, you know, connecting. But I think that's an advantage because then... For example, like I said, when I was in Vancouver, when I was with the First Nations, I could explain to them about what we did in the Goethe and in the African Museum, and they can relate, I think, more because I'm not an academic. I think it actually helps not to be an academic in a, in a sense. And so, yeah, I feel like it's just a natural way of working, and I'm sure I'll continue to do so. Thank you, thank you, Grace. Uh, Bianca, I think you were there also huh, at the um, Grace performance uh, at uh, at uh, at the Africa Museum. You, no, you, I, no, I, uh, I wasn't, no. unfortunately. Okay, okay, but also you you um, you were in Brussels in some of, of the other uh, events in um, during the workshop. Um, so yes, please, um, if you can share with us, you know, how you experienced this project and also, of course, your artistic contribution, your important and beautiful artistic contribution to the project and also to the exhibition, actually. Thank you. Um, so thanks again to everyone. And I'll be the last thanks um, for today. Um, and it was a great project over um, yeah, a number of years. So I, it was also also in my work showed a kind of development also of the different thinking also with regards to different ways of, of looking at, at an archive and what, what constitutes an archive. So um, indeed, I, I, my work was presented in two forms. So indeed in the exhibition format, um, which was a work um, where I worked in a, in a quite an unusual collection, unusual in European terms, which was a, a missionary collection in Slovenia. So it wasn't actually a, didn't have the, the, the classic colonial ties as, as with the bigger, bigger powers in Europe. So this is the work that, that was showed in, in Torino. Um, 
and it was also an, an uh, it was an invitation to to reflect on on this on this African collection that they had and. Um, and for me, what became really evident was that the, the photographic archive that um, of this construction be, was more interesting. So it was actually the first uh, telecommunications tower that was constructed um, by the German telecommunications company uh, Telefunken. And so this idea was also to kind of invisibly connect um, Togo, which was at that moment a German colony, and um, and Germany, so this idea of this kind of invisible empire, which which became a kind of also kind of marked a new generation in term in colonial thinking. So it was not it was kind of after the but later kind of after the kind of initial extractive one, and was thinking more in a technological infrastructure which kind of spread its arms over continents um, invisibly. And um, at the same time, also by a happenstance, which is often how I approach archives. So you, I often, I'm not really sure what I'm looking for. Is that more that these these things appear? And um, and the second um, object that I that I encountered was a special was a specific talismanic object, which is used um, to draw a talismanic infrastructure. And this talisman was interesting for me because instead of uh, showing a symbolic um, par, uh, image uh, like a an eye or a rabbit's foot um, this talisman man created an infrastructure and so between these two infrastructures that of the communications tower and that of the the talismanic maze labyrinthian structure I created um, this work um, which also uses um, archival images, but also CGI um, images, so computer generated images um, to create a kind of uh, journey or a quest, if you imagine a kind of point of view of a, of a, from, a from a, uh, a game, you kind of go through this labyrinthian structure and are also able to have views of this, of this infrastructure that are not only from the body. Um, and then maybe that goes on to the next work, um, which is only shown in its kind of early stages in, in as a kind of is a poem in, in the book. Um, and this again shifts the position right out of the body and that into the tree. Um, and this project is still at the beginning stages because for many reasons, uh, as we know, we, we haven't been able to travel um, recently. And um, this project also started again from the from an image. So um, this image sh showed um, a sycamore, uh, a hundred year old sycamore um, in the Oroma region near to Addis Abeba. And um, this image was taken during the Italian occupation. And so this tree um, was a marker for me when I first visited the, the region to try and also find the buildings that were depicted in these, uh, in these images, because the, the tree was the only thing that still stood. So from the perspective of the tree, um, this, this narrative is told. So this is an important part of my work is also how speculation and narrative can be a means to, to, to fill those kind of gaps, those those holes or maybe the losses as we see when things are missing or, or burnt or destroyed um, and how we can create a kind of um, opportunity in those um, fragments. And so I would like to end just by um, in a very classic uh, book presentation format perhaps um, to read this small, um, small poem, I guess, um, as a, as a to end. So here we go. So you settle on my image, a majest majestic sycamore fig tree, Ficus sycamorus. Like a constant, I occupy tremendous time, a non-human witness in the Oromia region, west of Addis Abeba. I challenge your entire idea of historical time, its divide into pre and post occupation. What is a year or even a decade if I already was standing tall to hear the cries of victory traveling south from the Battle of Adwa when the Italians were famously defeated? An important fact is cemented here for you as you confront your settled view of time. Here, her calendar system, a year of 13 months, her clock cycle begins at dawn. Thank you.
thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Bianca, for uh, yeah, this um, this poem, this text. It's really the the power of uh, of heart, huh? And uh, and, um, and 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 poetry. Um, uh, Yana, um, could you maybe tell us more uh, a bit more about you know yes this exhibition, and uh, also you worked with um, um, a collective uh, uh, which work on on sound archive huh? troubled uh, archives and and several uh, artists. Um, how I mean did you work with uh, with Bianca with Grace and and the other artists for, for this exhibition because I mean also the, the, um, the issues and the topics of the book and the project uh, are so large and transversal so how did you um, I mean work and, and, and manage to really yeah uh, try to to curate them through through an exhibition? And, and, and mute. Yeah. I have to unmute myself. Mm. Sorry. Um, uh, thank you. I think what you already saw during the presentation is that um, artists have a very different, uh, much more personal approach uh, when it comes to working uh, with art, um, with archives, but also within ethnographic collections. And I found this idea that the artist is a kind of like troublemaker. It's someone who is coming from outside and is having um, not only um, like it's different to an academic approach, it's sometimes more subjective, intuitive. This research leads uh, to us uh, very interesting and um, yeah, ways when it comes to dealing with archival images. And um, in the exhibition in Torino, in Torino that we put together, on the one hand, it was important to um, yeah, have been in collaboration and in exchange with the artists already over a longer um yeah during the longer process of of the project itself and on the other hand also to show how different archival research could look like uh, we see uh, you mentioned just um for example the collective troubled archive um that consists of um mainly also um Antje van Wichelen and Rokia Bamba who are here based in Brussels and they did um a very specific research on um an archive from the uh, Consolata della Missione, from the missionaries uh, in Torino itself. And it's a Catholic um, um, yeah, archive that is still accessible. And uh, we went on several also research trips before the uh, exhibition took place. And they reused uh, these very, um, yeah, violent images uh, not in the way that they would re-show it um, but they would um, uh, work with this in a different manners so on the one hand there was a kind of 60 millimeter like an old film installation i think we don't have a presentation in, in that um, uh, powerpoint um, but uh, and uh, the sound artist Rukia Bamba also dived deeper into sound archives so it was really like a, a, a very um, yeah, psychophysical experience when you um, um, were seeing these images and the other image that we were seeing before was um, transfer transferring these uh, um, critical imagery into the age of the digital and was showing how today um, facial recognition uh, technology is uh, functioning and this is when you see the other exactly this image uh, it was a kind of participatory project um, because the collective created uh, a website uh, where um, the visitors of the exhibition could take uh, photos of themselves that would match with the um, digital database online and then uh, show images of uh, the visitors themselves that were mingled with different colonial images and the material and you could have access to this. So it was also, um, yeah, it's uh, this critical um, idea to see the kind of uh, visibility and invisibility when it comes, but also to relate how images are still circulating, colonial images and what they, and also how racist um, um, algorithms are, are still surrounding us. So there were many different um, yeah, things that came together in this project. And then of course also Bianca and Grace who were just um, 
presenting also took part in the project with different approaches we see here. Uh, ongoing personal archive, uh, a quest for meaning from Grace and uh, Bianca just introduced her work. So yeah, that in a very short summary, <laughs> but um, yeah, to put it in a nutshell, I think it was for us also because we spoke so much about Corona and uh, this is a digital book presentation. It was almost a magical moment um, if the team from the Fondaciona is still um, listening and uh, Clementine also said it uh, before in her presentation. Uh, for us, it was so important to be there, to, to handle the artworks, to, to be together and to really create um, a space also of a debate because it was a possibility to speak with the visitors that the digital format is not um, yeah, opening. And also the research was very important with us to be there together it was almost magic, like to have a dinner with people, especially in north of Italy, in the north where the crisis was like the Corona crisis hit so fast. Um, yes, one more question for you, Jana, because uh, as we said, um, the, um, the project uh, gathered really different uh, uh, people uh, from different countries with different languages and also really mm. from uh, different, uh, I mean, social uh, fields. Uh, there were uh, academics, um, mm. uh, professionals, activists, artists. Uh, um, I can imagine it was not really a smooth, uh, really, I mean, uh, uh, process to, to, um, uh, to succeed in, in really gathering uh, this different uh, person. How did you, did you manage with it? And how, uh, what was the reaction, you know, of these different um, uh, uh, persons uh, involved in the, in the, in the project? The stakeholders, yeah, I mean, all these different stakeholders, because I mean, that's was really, mm -hmm. I think, one of the challenges of the project. And we know mm -hmm. how sensitive are all these questions. And um, I mean, this sometimes it's just difficult to uh, really uh, succeed in, you know, um, bringing everybody in on, you know, on the table and, and discussing. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe you can share with us, uh, I mean, the ac achievement you, you you've made with this and also maybe also the limits of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. maybe you faced in uh, trying to really gather different peoples with really all these different uh, experiences. Yeah, it's a very good uh, question. Of course, it was very intense always. <laughs> and um, also because but as we were also prepared because the attempt also to, to bring together these different um, groups and um, like um, yeah, like also opinions and way uh, ways of um, dealing and uh, formulating uh, led uh, sometimes to very heated debates. But uh, on the other hand, it was very important for us because you addressed the question of language. We always work with different like translators and interpreters. Um, so um, we were very aware, and this was also an issue that we faced with the publication. I saw before that there was a question which language uh, the book is uh, um, published, and it is English. And um, of course, like this was a decision that was not like easy. We wanted to do this with the English publishing publishing house to to reach as many people as possible. But on the other hand, this is also excluding. Uh, several people and this is also the question of course when it comes to the whole academic debate so um, I had the feeling that during the whole project I often felt also myself like a kind of translator between and I had I learned so much also on um, on not only on the colonial history of uh, Germany and of um, of other countries but also of course about like my own privilege and of uh, how questions are um, debated differently than in academic field where you often have like a, um, a stage and the an audience. <laughs> and uh, so we, we created a kind of like workshop, workshop uh, like really behind closed doors. And I think this was a very good idea because this enabled the people to, to speak much more personal. And, um, and on the other hand, also the idea was to to have this project really on a long term over the length of like two years and to see each other again, not like only one weekend. And then um, 
you you lose with the debate, but also to give time to 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 rethink uh, and to to stay in in touch. And I hope, yeah, for for most of us, this uh, was fruit, fruitful, and that we were able to also create a yeah a space of trust. I think uh, this is very important. Thank you. Um, would you want to add something on you know especially this uh, yes this particular uh, I mean uh, issue and topic of the project this this diversity Clementine is it something really that um, I mean uh, strikes you or interest, interested you or uh, you you're mute you're mute mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I was still coming back to Duane's uh, issue, really, which is an um, enormous one. Um, and that is how you reconstitute an archive or how, how do you, what do you do with this absence, this loss? And I was wondering who the agents are in this kind of process. And obviously it's, it has to be primarily citizens. It, it has to be citizens getting involved in the reconstruction of memories and getting, uh, in other words, it's all about, in a sense, building it inside out, the process. And I think that there has to be a combination of, of citizens engagement, citizens museum product, you know, citizens engagement in, in this new, new potential for a collection for, because obviously you don't have to construct it in the same way as it was once set up. And this is really important. So at the same time, I would have thought that uh, the question of the restitution now of archives from the UK and from Holland mm. um, would be now, I mean, the leverage of getting back documents, photographs, anything that might have, where you can say, okay, this has now been destroyed. Now you give us what you have, you know? We're not asking for, uh, the, for the, the, you know, the, the most expensive objects that you feel you own, but we're asking for everything that you might have that corresponds to what we lost. And that that type of, uh, that is a kind of, I think, a urgency, a rapid response restitution. I think it's something where you have to build the momentum. And I think it's a really interesting point because we have, um, uh, we have, we have to also confront the fact that archives are still being made, that collections are still being mm. purchased, that there are, with the, the debates around restitution, there is a, um, uh, something that disturbs me deeply, and that is that there's not enough attention paid to the 20th century. And by that, I don't, I, I, I mean, really, like uh, the, the, the movements of painters, of sculptors, of activists of performance artists of 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 all these people who were active then during you know the say from beginning of the 1900s through to the end of the 20th century and whose work is not being um i mean it features a little bit in few in a few auctions but generally speaking it's not been considered the restitution question focuses again on what is considered to be the most valuable from the point of view of the tribal art market or the iconic uh it's heavily loaded and i think that this that in order to see a kind of caput mortum phase come out of this terrible destruction in order to build something then i think that this kind of disaster should provide in a in an unfortunate but important way leverage to get restitution uh, happening on a different level, on a different plane. I can't abide hearing any more about 26 objects being returned to Benin City. Mm. I mean, I just want to go, I, I, I can't bear it. There are so many different archives, you know, the whole question of should you return the violent photographic archives that were produced by colonial people, should they be returned back if they're over in Hamburg or in Munich or in Berlin? Are these the photographs that should be returned? And maybe these are not the photographs that need to be returned. Maybe this is the colonial archive as such, right? Uh, of sure, sure, it's important for identifying people and families and reconstructing lost histories. But there are other elements that need to be returned now speedily, 
you know, so that work can continue in relation to, because the moment that a new archive would be returned and restituted, the act of opening it up, the act of engaging this archive into a dialogue with citizens who are still alive from the 20th century, right? Who have mm -hmm. memories, who can remember the, the pre-apartheid period, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of this needs to be done now with a lot more, um, less pussyfooting around restitution. This is really crucial that, that I, sorry, uh, that I'll stop immediately, but that, that students, people who are 24, are now at the front line of these demands, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it can't just be discussions between cultural politicians and, and sweetie academics. It has to go beyond this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank, you, thank you for that point, uh, um, uh, Clementina. Uh, yeah, it's interesting, this, this massive um, void that, that, that we now have this huge um, epistemic scar that we have on the University of Cape Town campus can never be filled in the same way, can never be reconstituted in the same way again. Um, how, However, it, it does, you, as you put it, in, in human interest. Connection is with that. The established with our um, uh, former colonial uh, partners. Um, but it leaks and, and our... We don't hear you very well, Duane. Um, so yeah, don't know if it's your connection or, uh, please, if you could can, just repeat. Yeah, can you the, hear me the, now? Can, yes, it, now it's better. Yeah, please. Is it a little so bit could, better? Yeah, yes, please. So if you just could repeat, you know, yes, the, the last sentences, because we didn't hear you. No, I was just going to say that it, it, it reformulates the restitution uh, question in, in an interesting way. Um, like our institution will formulate exactly what how bold because the nature of that that relationship that's important um but all our archives will be constituted so um the archival Duane, we're so sorry, that, we don't hear you. There's a problem with, with there, your connection. Um, are problematic and, and our institutions have already questioned them. Ah. We didn't hear you yeah, very well. We're sorry, but if you want to write maybe uh, uh, something in the chat, because yeah, just, yeah, uh, to end. Actually, it's almost, um, half past eight already. Um, we had um, uh, some uh, comments of, um, uh, from the public, but not really real questions. Uh, that's why, you know, yes, we, we, we had time for, for the conversation, if, even if we were a bit, um, uh, a bit late. Um, I think, yeah, it's, it's almost uh, in the end of the, of the webinar, but uh, uh, I would like maybe um, to ask you, uh, each, um, each of you, if you would like uh, to end, uh, maybe just to um, sum up, you know, what will be, you know, for you, uh, what will you um, uh, uh, keep in mind, you know, from, from the project and, uh, and what is uh, coding, um, to you, you know, the best uh, achieve, achievement of the of the of the project. Maybe also it's a it's a way to um, to for the public to just uh, say that you know then they can uh, read the book and and uh, discover more of the project. So maybe we can just uh, make this uh, yes uh, this re this tour. Uh, um, Yana, do you want to? To, to start and then yes. Clement. Oh, um, I have to unmute. No, I'm unmuted. <laughs> no, um, just uh, 
before saying something for the future, I just uh, thought that it said that we couldn't hear Duane, but um, related to also what um, Clementine said, I really found this model that um, Ya presented the kiosk museum, the mobile ar archive, a very um, great argument and an example of how we can think museum and archives and um, um, not only from a like arch architectural like hoarding <laughs> uh, institutional institution but something that is open and is accessible and one of the main arguments that uh, I heard during the last years was always from anthropologists and museum experts like to say we can't give the objects we can't restitute, uh, restitute because the museums are not ready and um, they there's not enough money uh, they need like to be prepared and all these arguments are um, so limited and uh, I think what I take uh, with me on the way is uh, that, that there are so many interesting um, creative solutions and there's so many different points of views how to think um, on the one hand, the concept of the museum, on the other hand, like how uh, to let in open and like doing critical research within um, uh, museums, um, but also how to, to work uh, transnational and how to, to, um, to learn from each other. And this is something that I, I hope will also continue with the project. The Goethe Institute is working on several other um, um, institute um, uh, projects, for example, the the museum conversation in Namibia, or there is a latitude platform, and I hope that um, we will be able to to yeah, continue and to to bring uh, all the knowledge that was produced, uh, and also like yeah, in other ways that that will continue and also to collaborate with you. That is yeah. maybe I don't know. Yeah, you would yeah, like please, to continue yes, with, yes, with yes. the kiosk yeah. Yes, um, when you were speaking about that, it, it reminded me, um, actually another one of the books that um, Sternberg Press published, Institution as Praxis, was mm -hmm. something that I think um, informed a lot of my, my reflections on the curatorial strategy of the kiosk museum, but also what other kind of um, curatorial strategy we could take. I, I, I really loved um, Grace's description of like healing in the museum and just um, this shift again, for me, um, where I'm at is really thinking of values, um, thinking of value first approach as opposed to, um, I guess, yeah, like oh, focusing on the the values of it, and so if the uh, the context and the history of museums is one that is built on extraction, accumulation, and othering, then what does it look like if that is shifting to a place where people are invited to feel and dream um, and collaborate, and then from there, like trying to develop a curatorial strategy that makes space for that. Um, but I, I just wanted to plug that book and also some of the other panelists works that I think is really in line with um, what I hope to see this experimentation um, to, to come with it. And I think something that I've taken away from today is that no one really has the answers, but that's also okay. I think museums are part of that like sort of colonial relationship to knowledge is always needing to appear as though you know, <laughs> as though there is a right answer, as though there is a conclusion, but most of the time there isn't. Um, and just like being open with that also as a curator, um, as a, an educator in anything, um, being open with not knowing and journeying with others to, to know something. Um, but yeah, so thank you again. Thank you, Jan, thank you. Um, Grace? Yes, I mean, for me, I feel like the project's still continuing. I mean, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad there's a book and an exhibition, but I'm more concerned that people keep working on the subject, that it's not just like a fashionable moment, you know, of people's interests, you know, um, in the West on the subject, and then they forget about it. Do they understand this is some long-term work? And so that's my... Um, I guess um, interest and also that this that the, the the subject can only ever be resolved when it you have both the grassroots element you know of um, the local the indigenous um, the activist and the top tier you know of the museums the academic I mean it's both you know to deal with 
this subject you know i mean it's kind of one of the subjects that bring us together as humans just like climate change i mean it, it's be it's bigger than every individual this museum question you know and this restitution question and it's bigger than probably even our generations different generations so yeah it's like to think about legacy you know um always thinking about that bigger question of time and deep time and where we fit into that so yeah that those are the questions and thoughts i'm going to continue with okay thank you thank you grace if you yes um bianca did you want to be share yeah a uh, few words with us yeah, well, um, I think one of the, 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 the great aspects about this project was, of course, to get to know people, uh, not only in Brussels that I didn't know before, but also just to, to connect to, to people who are, who are so, you know, thinking through the same questions. And I think uh, relating a little bit to what Clementine was saying about the organ and also Grace and yeah, this, um, for me, in my own work, this idea of the archive has really become embodied. And I think that's also maybe because... Um, yeah, as we already spoke about it, um, we are also traumatized after our living through this pandemic. So the questions become more urgent, maybe they become therapeutic. Um, and so this question of how, how you relate uh, personally becomes um, more urgent um, than the big museum and, the, and their, their collection, but those personal and um, and urgent, uh, personally urgent questions uh, come into, into circulation. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Duane, I don't know if you now your connection is, is better. Maybe, you, uh, yes, the, the last word will be uh, uh, for you. Uh, and also if you want maybe to, to, to share a contact <coughs> or so, you know, maybe the, um, uh, the participants or uh, the public could uh, maybe stay in touch with uh, with you or the initiative you will uh, maybe um, I mean launch you know to um, to face you know your the situation um, please um, um, uh, really thanks I, I would just suggest that um, uh, that you keep checking the the University of Cape Town's website okay. the the main web website um, for information about what's going on. That's uh, the main port of call for uh, where you can find out uh, who to contact and what you can do. Um, as to the project, I think uh, it's been said so many times so far. Um, it's just like the way in which the project connected interested groups across Europe thinking about similar things, but from very different perspectives. I think that was the great benefit for me. Um, uh, participating with workshop participants in um, Barcelona it was absolutely wonderful to connect with the delegates there. Um, I still have um, some kinds of contacts with, with the delegates. Um, I feel that the connections that were established through the project are ongoing. They, they, they feel as if they are long lasting connections. And ultimately a project like this, um, it's not so much about the, the, these outputs, the exhibitions and the and the, and the products that come out of it, but it's the, the networks of relations that were produced that sit with me as, as, um, as helpful, as generative, as uh, transformative, that we, that, that we can share perspectives on, uh, on a common set of themes and issues um, so that we can uh, shift things forward and, and in new directions um, uh, through, this, uh, through this collaboration. So, yeah, thanks so much for, for connecting us all in this into these interesting yes, ways. Yeah. I think we can all really yeah thank and, and congratulate uh, Jana for uh, really yeah no created this this project and with the support of the of the Goethe Institute it was such yeah 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 no, an, an incredible um, an incredible project and uh, as um, as you said uh, for the dynamics are really now uh, ongoing and it, it's sure it's gonna uh, maybe have you know some continuations through uh, workshops and other projects, or even I think an, an exhibition because also the exhibition uh, may be itinerant huh? uh, if you um, if you if you find also different uh, a museum interested in. 
Um, so it's time now. We are, we are a bit late, but I really uh, would like to, to thank you um, very much for, for this uh, webinar, for being, has, uh, being with us um, this evening. I would like to uh, thank really my, my colleague, um, also Olga, um, who coordinates uh, all the, the webinar. Uh, many thanks. The public also, many thanks. There was not a lot of questions, but... Uh, um, Maybe um, you just uh, reserve yourself and, and you will read the book. Uh, it will be um, uh, soon uh, available, uh, I think, uh, in different bookshops. And uh, I, I know uh, uh, in, uh, at the, the Boza bookshop for sure mm -hmm. uh, in, um, in a few days. So it's really a kind of very inspiring and, 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 deep, uh, and deep book. Um, just um, before ending, uh, we would like just to uh, mention two conferences um, that will take place in the coming days and really related to, to the subject. The first one is a conference um, by uh, Margareta van Oswald, uh, who uh, was a participant uh, of, the, of the project. And um, she's the author of a, of a great book, uh, Beyond Anthropology. And she will make a, a conference um, organized by the Frag Bordeaux and Musée d'Aquitaine. So uh, it will be in French and it will be on the uh, 29th of uh, mm -hmm. April. And so we share the link if you're interested in uh, following it. And uh, the second one is, um, uh, also a debate on uh, all the um, uh, 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 question issues of uh, colonial monuments in the public spaces and it's organized by uh, curated by Dory Wilson, uh, our partner of the Afropolitan uh, Forum program and it will be on the um, 14th of May uh, and it will be on Boza uh, website. So also uh, we share the, um, the link so you can uh, register. Uh, it was a great, uh, great pleasure to be, uh, to be with you. And uh, I'm sure, yeah, our um, road will, uh, will, will cross and we'll meet again. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Duan, we are really um, yeah, with you. A lot of yeah, thoughts of uh, courage and, and, and solidarity with you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, have a nice evening. Bye.